Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello and welcome to today's program. We're glad that you're tuning in to us and listening. Uh, my name is Tom Rainwater, and beside me here in the studio is William Stewart, who it's always an honor to have you here. It's good to be with you, Tom. And we're studying today the conversion of Simon the Sorcerer, and this is found in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and the text is verses 4 through 25. And last program, William, we were talking about persecution that the Christians were going through, specifically that which was directed against Stephen, that he was put to death by his fellow Jews for preaching about Jesus and making application to them that they were unfaithful to God and to Moses and what had been said in the Old Testament. And, of course, they killed him. And there was a great persecution that started against the church there in Jerusalem. And this had the effect of scattering the saints. Christians now aren't going to just be in Jerusalem. Because of the persecution, they're fleeing to other places. But as they go to other places, they take the gospel with them. And so here's the spreading of the gospel and the area, the region just to the north of Jerusalem and Judea is that of Samaria. And one of those who goes to that area fleeing from Jerusalem is Philip. And he stops there and he begins to preach. It says in Acts 8 and verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So he stops, and he's preaching about Jesus Christ. And so, as we've seen before, William, persecution didn't hinder the church or stop it. It worked to its spreading. That's right, Tom. Now, I'm drawn back to Acts chapter 5. Remember, we met Gamaliel there, who was perhaps the only sound mind on the council. And he had cautioned them, you know, be careful what you do. And he gave them a couple of examples. Remember this person and how... After he was slain, those who had obeyed him were scattered, and they came to nothing. And, and remember this other individual, and after he had perished, those who had been obedient to him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. And perhaps it was the intent of the Jews to try and cause a scattering by means of persecution. And indeed, that's what took place. They persecuted, and so the, the saints were scattered. But they were scattered... And they went everywhere preaching the word. They were scattered, but it didn't come to nothing. In fact, what took place is the gospel would grow. The kingdom of God would grow on account of the scattering. And so the Jewish leaders ought to have their answer to whether this is of God or not. Remember, Gamaliel said, if it's of God, you cannot overthrow it lest you be found to fight against God. Well, it's obvious that it's of God. It's scattered and it's growing. The gospel is prospering. Now, the more they persecute it, the greater it becomes. The more glory goes to God. Exactly. And another proof that this is from God is that those who are scattered perform miracles. And that's what Philip is doing here in Samaria. It says in verse 6, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, it would be wise perhaps to stop right here and talk about this ability to perform miracles. The Christians in the first century, many of them had this ability. They were given that ability by the apostles. And the reason that they all were able to perform miracles was to confirm that what they were saying to the crowds about Jesus Christ was true. The miracle just verified that God is behind their preaching. And so the people are amazed at the things which Philip is able to do miraculously and so they're listening to the message. Great multitudes coming out there. And Tom, I think it's important for us to note, it's not the apostles who were scattered here. Back in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says that all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. These are the disciples who are scattered. These are your average Christians who are scattered. Sometimes folks get the idea that we need to be some great person of faith like the apostles to go and preach the word. And that's not the case. These are the people who had assembled together, 
constantly in Jerusalem listening to the apostles teaching and now because of the persecution they're going their separate ways but they go teaching people the gospel and some of them like Philip would be skilled in the word others may not be so skilled in the word but they love the Lord and they wanted to do what they could in order to spread the word of God and so they went they went everywhere preaching. Right, and eventually the apostles did go everywhere, as they were told to do. We don't see exactly when this took place in the book of Acts, but they went all over the world, and uh, we will see later on especially the work of Paul when he became an apostle uh, after his conversion. But here, focusing on the work of Philip, as you said, a man who was zealous for God and, and wanting to spread the word, He's performing these miracles, and the city is just elated. There's great joy in the city in verse 8, not only because there were miracles performed there, but they are receiving the truth of God. Now, let's consider the audience here. These are Samaritans, and the Jews despised the Samaritans. But Jesus didn't. (laughs) You remember that Jesus taught the Samaritan woman in in John chapter 4, Here, God is spreading the gospel from the Jews to the Samaritans and then eventually to all the Gentiles. So here they are, joyous that they're not being excluded. The Samaritans are used to being excluded. They're included in the great preaching of truth. Now, before Philip came to town, there was a man called Simon that we begin reading about in verse 9, and he practiced sorcery. He was a, a magician, kind of a trickster. And you know how when you go to a magic show these days, there are certain tricks and it it looks like they're performing magic, but we know that magic isn't real. But these people were fooled into thinking that Simon had great power, and, and that's why he was doing these tricks. He wanted people to believe that he was some great god and some great man. And he was claiming to be someone great. It says that they gave heed to them, all of them, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And and he had fooled them for a very long time, according to the text. But, as we said, when Philip comes to town, things change. Because you can tell the difference between a trickster and one who can really perform a miracle. Philip wasn't doing things that were sleight of hand. He wasn't doing things that you couldn't verify. He was causing those who were lame to walk. Uh, He was casting out uh, demons, and there was demon possession in the first century. And I think God allowed that for a time to show that those who were preaching and teaching in his name had greater power, that God's power is always greater than that of Satan. But Philip is performing these miracles so that then his audience will listen to the truth as he preaches to them how to be saved from their sins. Now, Tom, as we consider the message that he's preaching, we don't have specifics of all that he said. But we find that he preached things concerning the kingdom of God, which, recall back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we saw the beginning of the kingdom of God. And he preached the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. Remember from chapter 4, there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And as a result of his preaching about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, we're told both men and women were baptized. Recall back in chapter 2, when Peter was asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He responded to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so the message hasn't changed. The message is still about the kingdom of God, about the resurrected Christ, and the means whereby we enter that kingdom has not changed. It's still by repentance and baptism for the remission of sins. And so men and women came and were baptized. And verse 13 tells us that Simon himself also believed, and that when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. But we need to emphasize there's consistency in Scripture so far as what men should do that they might be saved. And time and again, there's this need for baptism unto the remission of sin, baptism to be added to the kingdom of God. You know, William, it's a shame that there are so many religious groups out there who deny that baptism is essential to salvation when, as you said, it was commanded in Acts chapter 2, and whenever the gospel was preached... People responded by being baptized. 
And as we go through the book of Acts in this series, we're going to look at each case of conversion and see what people did to become Christians. And your point is, is right, that Scripture is consistent. And too many people are saying today, well, we shouldn't preach about baptism. We just should preach Jesus only. Well, Philip is preaching Jesus. He is preaching the kingdom. And since the people respond by being baptized, we have to come to the conclusion that preaching Jesus and preaching the kingdom means preaching baptism. It means preaching the requirements for salvation. And so, men and women were baptized. They had their sins washed away. And Simon is a believer too. He believes and he is baptized. So, what are we to do to become Christians today? Well, we also need to believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized. It's that simple. It's that easy. And so we can also assume that Simon repented of his sins because he's no longer going to be trying to fool the people. He's seen that Philip's miracles are true and that he needs to stop what he's doing and follow Jesus Christ. Now, Tom, as we continue on at verse 14, the text tells us, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. As we read that portion of text, Tom, it's interesting to note the purpose for which the apostles had come down. They had heard that there were Christians in Samaria now, that God's word was received there. And so Peter and John come, verse 15 tells us, they come to pray that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And then verse 17, they laid hands on them and they did receive the Holy Spirit. And so as we look at the apostles and what they're doing here, they are imparting the Spirit to these people. The people had, at that point, not yet received the Spirit. They had not yet fallen upon them in in the miraculous measure, which we read about elsewhere in the text. And as Simon observes what's going on, he notes that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, verse 18, the Holy Spirit was given. It's obvious that Philip had received the Spirit himself because he's working these miracles and these signs But Philip was unable to pass on the gift of the Spirit to those whom he taught. There's an important lesson for us to learn here about the passing on of the Holy Spirit, the the receiving of the Holy Spirit in miraculous measure. It didn't just pass on from Christian to Christian by the laying on of hands of one Christian to another Christian, but that specifically the laying on of the apostles' hands is how one might receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's right, William. And there are some people, religious people today, who believe that they today can perform miracles in the name of Jesus. Uh, That's not so. The day of miracles is over, and I believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the duration of those gifts are discussed, that they are only temporary, until the perfect came, that is the completed word of God. They didn't have the New Testament yet, as Philip is going around preaching, and it wasn't completed then. So their message had to be confirmed as being true by these miracles. And so when the word was completed, there was no longer any need for the miracles. We have the word, and it's been confirmed by the miracles that were performed in that age. And there are no longer any apostles living today. As you pointed out, William, it was only the apostles who could pass on the gifts. Uh, When they died, then that ability was gone. It was a circumstance that was unique there to the first century. But as Simon sees that the apostles have this ability to pass this on, he wanted that for himself because he's thinking, you know, I can be a great man again and people will look to me and I'll have this. And, And what he does is he offers money to Peter and John that he could have that too. And he said in verse 19, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon has the wrong attitude. And so Peter rebukes him strongly and says, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God 
could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And so he calls on Simon to repent of his wickedness. Repent, therefore, in verse 22, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And so he, as a Christian who's committed sin, is given instructions on how that sin may be lifted. That's exactly right, Tom. He needs to repent of his wickedness. It's obvious that he is a Christian. Verse 13 told us that he also believed and he was baptized. But even the child of God is susceptible to sin. The child of God can be tempted. And on this occasion, Simon was tempted and drawn away from that which is right and good and just before God. And so he needed to repent. He needed to pray to God. He needed to confess his sin to God. And then perhaps the thought of his heart would be forgiven him. In 1 John and chapter 1, at verse 9, we're told that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What Peter told Simon to do on this occasion is the very thing that John writes in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. You need to confess your sin. And if you do so, God will be faithful and be just and he'll forgive that God will pardon the thought of your heart. Verse 23, Peter tells us a little bit more about where Simon's heart is at this point. He says, I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. When we allow our own desires to take over, then we're going to slip into sin. And we'll be bound in iniquity, as Peter says to Simon on this occasion. And so we need to always have a focus for the will of God. That's right. And Peter is warning Simon that his soul is in danger. And there are a lot of religious people today who believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved. That when you become a Christian, that there's nothing you can do to be lost. This does not match with the text. Simon was in danger. And he had sin back on his record. He had slipped back into his old ways. And it was demanded that he repent and pray. And you made such a great point there, William, that the way a Christian has his sins forgiven is a little bit different than one who is not a Christian. Because as we've seen earlier on, Simon, before he was a Christian, it was required that he believe and be baptized. That took care of his sin. But becoming a Christian and sinning again, does that mean he has to be baptized every time he sins? No, because God's law of pardon for the Christian is different. You need to pray to God. You need to repent and pray to God for forgiveness. We as Christians have Christ as our intercessor, as our mediator. And he's willing to forgive us of our sin if we'll change. Tom, you had mentioned that Simon's soul was in danger at this point. And there are certain words in the text that demonstrate that to be the case to us. In verse 20, when Peter said, Your money perish with you. Simon is going to perish, and he's not talking about his physical death. He's talking about him spiritually. He is a man slated for spiritual death at this point because of the condition of his heart. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. In regard to the things of God, the things of the Spirit, the gift of God, your heart is not right in the sight of God. He's guilty of wickedness. He needs the thought of his heart to be forgiven. He is poisoned by bitterness. That's not a description of one who is being faithful to God. He is bound in iniquity. If we're bound up in iniquity, we're bound in that which brings forth death. And so he is at this point, though a Christian, one whose soul is in danger of judgment and of hellfire. And that's right, William. And here Simon understands the danger that he's in. And he responds to Peter's rebuke by saying, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So, he knows he's in danger. And he doesn't want his soul to be in that condition. So, he asks for Peter to pray for him. And it's a legitimate request, if we indeed have fallen into sin as Christians, that we can ask people to pray on our behalf. It goes without saying that 
we're repenting and praying along with them, but it is indeed proper that we pray for each other. Tom, his request reminded me of something that we studied not too long ago in the book of James, James chapter 5 and verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another. Of course, Simon's had his pointed out to him. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. When we're bound in sin, when we've done that which is contrary to the will of God, the shame that is felt sometimes makes us feel like, oh, who am I that I might pray to God? And so he's asking Peter, will you pray for me? In essence, though his sins are pointed out to him, he is confessing when he says, Pray for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. He's confessing, you're right. I'm guilty of what you say. And so, please, Peter, pray for me so that so that God might forgive me. And so now, we, when we get to verse 25 here at the end of the program, it says, that, So when they, speaking of Peter and John, had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And so here you have these two apostles preaching all over the land of Samaria to these people. Now, I think it's interesting, William, when you go back to the life of Jesus, there was a point in time in which the apostle John wanted Jesus to extinguish the Samaritans, to send fire down upon them. When you look back in Luke chapter 9, Jesus was passing through Samaria and was going to Jerusalem. And, of course, the Samaritans didn't like Jerusalem and didn't like the fact that Jesus was going there and refused to receive Jesus. And that's when James and John said to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? And apparently James and John didn't have any patience. God, you ought to just destroy them right now. But Jesus could see ahead of time. He, he tells them, he rebukes them, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So he tells them, you don't know what you're talking about. You're of the wrong spirit here. I, I'm here to save people. Well, here it is, later on, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and the spreading of the gospel, that the whole region of Samaria is taught the gospel. First beginning with Philip, and then Peter, and John. <laughs> the one who wanted to destroy them in the beginning. I'm sure he's glad now that uh, Jesus didn't follow through with his request. Indeed, Tom, that's an interesting point, And we need to learn that kind of patience as well. We might get a little bit in a huff at people at times and discourage that people are not willing to receive the Lord. We need to be patient. God will work things for good in His time and we don't always see. And we need to be careful about the manner of spirit we have lest we become like John when he wanted to just, you know, Lord, let's consume them. The Lord wants to save them and we need to want to save people through the preaching of the gospel as well. As we come to the close of our program today, let's quickly review the things that we have seen in this text. As we have seen in other texts, if we are to become a child of God, it is by believing the gospel message, by repenting of sin, and being baptized for the remission of sins. There are no alternative ways to become a Christian. This is the consistent pattern that we see in Scripture. And so we need to do. When we are a child of God, if we have sinned, we don't have to be baptized again in order to have our sins forgiven. God has forgiven us sin uh, when we were baptized. But if we sin again as a child of God, we're to repent of our sin. We're to pray to God, confess our sin to Him, that He might forgive the sin which we have. And we need to, as the people of God, have that fervent desire to spread the word of God. Remember back at verse 4, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And so we need to desire to share the word of God with those that we come in contact with, that the borders of God's kingdom might increase, that those who are in the kingdom might be encouraged, and those who are outside of the kingdom might be admonished to believe the gospel, to respond to the gospel message. Yes, and if we can help you in your Bible study, please call us. We'd love to help you. We'd love to meet you and sit down and talk about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing greater that we could do together than to sit and discuss God's great plan of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
If you're listening to our program and you enjoy the program, call us as well. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening to us. Have a great day. Thank you.